we can understand electronic spectroscopy a little bit better if we look at the potential energy diagrams. And so I'm going to go ahead and sketch out a potential energy diagram here. So I've gone ahead and, and sneakily drawn a quick potential energy diagram. So potential energy is on the vertical axis. The horizontal axis is uh, sort of this generalized coordinate. So if it's a diatomic, it's just the bond length. If it's a polyatomic, it's some function of all the bond lengths and angles in the molecule. The bottom curve here corresponds to my ground state, or GS for short. And the upper curve here corresponds to my first excited state, or actually any kind of excited state, I should say. We can draw the vibrational energy levels in. I'm going to go ahead and draw those in black for the grain state. So we know that it is a ladder uh, that looks something like this. So this is V double prime equals 0, 1, 2, and so on. So remember, we use that notation where the double prime is the initial and the single prime is the final. And we're going to go up to an excited state here. So uh, let's go ahead and draw the excited states in. So uh, if the bond is a little bit different in the excited state, these levels could be different distances apart. So uh, we'll talk about that later. So uh, these are my V prime equals 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And there's probably a whole bunch more excited states up there. Now one of the things we have to remember is that the spacing between the vibrational levels is very great. At room temperature, almost all molecules are in the grain vibrational state. So we are going to be starting off in this grain vibrational state, this V double prime equals zero. We have to go ahead and write the uh, wave function for vibrational motion. And uh, this is going to look something like this. It basically is just an exponential curve, right so. And uh, we have to remember something here, that we've got a principle called the Frank-Condon principle, after Frank and Condon, and basically we can interpret this as saying we have vertical transitions. So when we transition from one electronic state to another, we're going to go straight up and straight down. And so why are we going straight up and straight down? Well, horizontally, this is telling us about the motion of the atoms themselves. And electrons move super fast. In fact, the electrons move kind of like the gnats would on the back of an elephant. So the electrons move instantaneously, we're going to assume, compared to the nuclei. So what this means is that the electrons are going to move up and they're going to move into an excited state somewhere up here. And the atoms don't have time to move while the electrons are moving. So all our transitions are going to be vertical. I've sketched the uh, vibrational wave functions here we got from solving the Schrodinger equation. And if you remember, the square of the wave function tells us the probability. We can also see that the wave function is peaked in the center. So the highest probability location is in the center. That tells us that the atoms are likely to be in this horizontal position right here. So our transition is going to be vertically going directly through the center of that vibrational wave function. So let's start by drawing that, sketching that vertical motion like so. Before we finish it off, though, we should talk about the probability of a transition. So very roughly, the probability of a transition between a grain state and an excited state, or any two states, uh, initial and final, I suppose, is directly proportional to the square of the overlap of their wave functions. So we're just going to overlap the initial and the final wave function. And uh, this whole thing, actually, I believe we're going to square. And we can show here that this should be proportional to the overlap of the initial vibrational wave function times by the final vibrational wave function all squared as well. So we're really looking for very nice overlap of those two wave functions. So I'm going to go ahead and draw the vibrational wave functions in the excited state. So the vibrational wave functions, we've got one that looks like that. So no nodes. Here's the first one with a single node. And then the second one with uh, two nodes and so on. So we've got three nodes for this one. And one, two, three, four nodes for this one if I draw it right. So those are our vibrational wave functions here. We're looking for our maximal overlap. So I'm going to draw this vertical line on up. And uh, what I'm going to go ahead and do is look for that point where those wave functions overlap. And uh, at the lower right hand corner, right, I'm going to draw the V double prime equals zero wave function. And I'm going to look for an excited state vibrational wave function that overlaps. And so what I'm looking for is something that's going to have sort of a high kind of bump here. And uh, we're going to try and figure out where this is. So we're just going to keep going up vertically. And as we go on up, we can get to the tail of V prime equals 1. It overlaps a smidgen. And we can go on up. Uh, it's starting to overlap pretty good. And we get up to here, actually, and it probably overlaps super duper. And so we've got that strong overlap here between 
I guess this is the V prime equals three state and uh, the V double prime equals zero state. So we've just kind of brought those two vibrational wave functions over top of each other. And where they overlap strongly is the uh, place where we're gonna see an enhanced probability of transition. Notice for the excited state, apart from in the grain vibrational state, all the excited states, vibrational excited states, have a large lobe towards the end of the potential energy curve. And so on this side and on this side, these are the classical turning points. And it makes sense if a bond is vibrating, right, it's going to elongate and then it's going to turn around, it's going to compress and it's going to compress to its minimal point, right, and then it's going to uncompress and turn around and so these points here these are our classical turning points we might expect a bond to be more likely to be either at full extension or full compression than somewhere in the middle and this is true actually for uh, every vibrational state apart from the grain vibrational state where quantum mechanics says strangely enough it's most likely to be found in the center and not at those classical turning points so if we're going to go ahead and apply the Frank Condon principle, we normally just draw the vertical line up so the electrons move rapidly. And actually where we intersect the turning points, where we intersect the point where the vibrational energy level cuts the potential energy curve, we normally say as long as you can get to one of those, that is your highest probability transition. And we can see that this one here corresponds to V double prime equals zero going to V prime equals three. So we can go ahead and we can sketch an a, uh, electronic spectrum for this. We'll go ahead and sketch it down below. So I'm gonna draw from left to right, increasing wave numbers or frequency or inversely uh, related to wavelengths. I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna draw some lines here. So uh, this is zero frequency right here. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and have our spectrum. So uh, we're gonna have uh, a transition here. This is corresponding to uh, v double prime going to V prime. Uh, this would be the zero zero. The zero zero is a pretty low probability. The overlap of the V prime equals zero with the V double prime equals zero is pretty wimpy, right? That tail is barely out there. The uh, overlap between the V prime equals one state is a little bit better. V prime equals two is really quite good. And then three is optimal. Four is pretty darn good. And as we go to higher and higher, we actually get worse overlaps. So I'm going to go ahead and draw the spectrum here. The zero zero is uh, pretty wimpy. So if this is absorption going up here, low absorption. Zero one is actually starting to look fairly decent. So this is zero one. Uh, zero two with a much higher overlap, has a much higher probability, so this is pretty good. And we said that it peaks at zero three, so zero three is our highest probability. Zero four is pretty good, and as we go on further out, we should expect to see lower and lower probability transitions. This is called, by the way, a vibronic progression. In the gas phase, you might see these uh, lines there nice and sharp, but of course in the condensed phase, the molecules are colliding with one another, so we've got some sort of lifetime broadening going on here. So what we see is a, is a broadening of the spectrum, so it doesn't look nearly as sharp maybe as before. Okay, and maybe it looks something like that, or you know maybe you just see little ripples that look something like that. In a normal UV vis spectrum, of course, we plot um, increasing wavelength to the right, we plot uh, decreasing wavelength to the left. So uh, I guess new prime goes that way and uh, increasing wavelength goes this way. So this means our spectra would be backwards, I suppose. So we start with low energy, so 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 2, 0, 3, 0, 4, 0, 5, 0, 6, and so on. So a UV vis spectrum might look something like that. We can go ahead and we can take a molecule like benzene. And this is a very old UV vis spectrum. We've actually got the wavelength in angstroms here. So we're going from right to left to decreasing wavelength to increasing wave numbers or increasing energy. So we can see the vibronic progression here. So we're going from the ground state, V double prime equals zero, to the excited state. So this is V prime equals zero. This is V prime equals one, V prime equals two. We can see this is the highest probability. V prime equals three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And we've got some other electronic transitions sneaking in on the side here. So you've got these fingers in your spectrum, right? So they are commonly called fingers. And uh, just because they kind of remind us of the fingers on our hand. If we were super cool, right, we could go ahead and we can take the gaps here. The gaps here are telling us about HC times by the vibrational frequency in the excited state. So the excited state, right, those uh, vibrational energy levels 
we are basically climbing up and so we're learning about those so we can learn if the excited state is more tightly bonded together than the ground state or vice versa so we can actually look at the vibrational uh, excited states which is pretty hard to imagine because it's awfully hard to take an excited state molecule and put it in an infrared spectrometer and yet we can just take a ground state molecule put it in a UV vis the UV energy kicks it up to an excited state and we see that progression as we go along the different vibrational states in the excited state pretty awesome huh